The blank object seems to be to inculcate the grand moral lesson that under any circumstances, a life of sin is a life of slavery. Supreme? Mama Nisan, Hamos Nisan, And you can shop in your knife. Listen to deaths in the night. Winds of our own Do <laughs> Is it the moon's blank face? Is it the moon's blank face?
Maybe. Is it the moon's beautiful face? Distorted face. What would have distorted the beautiful moon's face? What is this from? This is from Peter Bell, a tale. His scorn. Oops. His scorn returns, his hate revives, he stoops the ass's neck to seize with malice that again takes flight, for in the pool a startling light meets him among the inverted trees. Is it the moon's distorted face, the ghost-like image of a cloud? Is it a gallows there portrayed? Is Peter of himself afraid? Is it a coffin or a shroud? A grisly idol, hewn in stone, or imp, with witch's lap let fall. Perhaps a ring of shining fairies, such as pursue their feared vagaries in sylvan bower or haunted hall. So, what would have distorted the beautiful moon's face? In this case, it is that is so weird. Why did it do that in both at once? Um, in the pool, a startling sight meets him among the inverted trees. So he sees, um, he sees the moon reflected in the pool.
blank works. Oh. Well, you should stick around and play this game. Let's get a good one. We cannot say that while this is written by an individual genius, that it is the work of a, what do you think? Um, hmm, kind of struggling here. This is not right, but, ooh, I like your answer a lot. Aha. Yeah, this is how you play. Very well done. I like your... In fact, I would give your answer a prize. Um, since it, it shows a, a devilish genius. Here. This one's German. Okay, how about this one? And Juan, on retiring for the night, felt restless and perplexed and compromised. He thought Aurora's raby eyes more bright than Adeline, such as advice, blank. If he had known exactly his own plight, he probably would have philosophized, a great resource to all and ne'er denied till wanted, well, therefore Juan only espied. Um, let's see, uh, felt and comp then, uh, this one's tough. I'm gonna say surmised and try and riff off the compromised um, rhyme. Once you get the hang of it, I'll show you the next step of the game. Advised. I was right on the uh, the blank or the uh, the rhyme, but I didn't get it right. The soul has felt it all. Oh, oh that uh, that one was, would have been good. Oh, here's an exclamation. That's Beowulf. Mm, that's. That's too much prose. Okay. Yeah, thanks. I, I made it. This is my uh, my ongoing um, opus. On that great day when first the martial train, big with the fate of Ilion, plowed the main, Jove on the right a blank signal sent, and thunder rolling shook the firmament. Here, with this one, I'll show you the next part of it. Um, so let's see, a blank signal. What type of signal? I'll say a, uh, frightening signal. Prosperous. Okay. Um, so now what I do is I ask a question about the context from where the quote came from, which I don't yet know where it came from. Um, so on that great day, when first the martial train plowed the main Jove, a signal sent and thunder. So what uh, signal was Jove sending? I will ask. And then as soon as I've asked that, then we learn where it came from. And this came from the Iliad, uh, translated by Alexander Pope. And so now what I'll do is I'm gonna pull up the actual context where the quote came from. Hmm. Let's see. Um, great day. 
on that great day. Are you having a great day, Tiffany? Oh, I'm in the wrong one. Okay, so I've located the context and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read um, some part around it and then the goal, oh good. The goal is to try and answer the question, which again was what signal was Jove sending? And that's all we have to focus our attention on other than you know perhaps enjoying the literature, which uh, uh, isn't a bad thing. Um, and let me just mark uh, in this, ah, mark, oh, 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 sorry, still getting my, uh, my, uh, maneuvers here. Um, uh, what was the, oh yeah, on that great day, um, oh yeah, okay. So this is, this is the, the actual line here, which I'm going to convert into uppercase to keep keep track. Um, so then Nestor thus, so what, what signal is Jove sending? These vain debates forbear, ye talk like children, not like heroes dare. Where now are all your high resolves at last? Your leagues concluded, your engagements passed. Vowed with libations and with victims then, now vanished, like their smoke, the faith of men. While useless words consume the unactive hours, no wonder Troy so long resists our powers. Rise, great Atreides, and with courage sway, we march to war if thou direct the way. But leave the few that dare resist at thy laws, the mean deserters of the Grecian cause, to grudge the mighty the conquest mighty Jove prepares and view with envy our successful wars. So notice he's addressing Jove, Nestor, the, uh, the elder. And here's the quote we had, the sentence we had. On that great day when first the martial train, big with the fate of Ilion, plowed the main, Jove on the right a prosperous signal sent and thunder rolling shook the firmament. So I asked um, what... What signal was Jove sending? And encouraged hence, maintain the glorious strife till every soldier grasp a Phrygian wife. That's pretty terrible. Till Helen's woes at full revenge appear and Troy's proud matrons render tear for tear. Before that day, if any Greek invite his country's troops to base in glorious fight, stand forth that Greek and host his sail to fly and die the dastard first who dreads to die. So I am going to say that the signal Jove was sending was that the Greeks will prevail in the Trojan War. And then it's done. And then we go on to the next quote. At last Phoebus Apollo smote his armor from him. Euphorbus thrust him through from behind and blank slew him. Um, I'll say ruthlessly. No, it's all going to be one word, and uh, the the dashes don't indicate the number of um, letters. And as as a, I do have it set up such that there is a kind of a minimum number of words, so um, it's probably at least five letters, a minimum number of letters. 
so yeah give, give it another shot your madman guess was was an excellent excellent first guess thinking this might be Homer as well which is really just happenstance since there's uh, right now about 275 different books in this yeah yeah well that's why it, I mean it's minimal some some are, some are low-hanging fruit um, you know this is a little bit archaic language but you know slew slow slayed so it's some someone got killed in some way, you know. You can guess it's kind of an adverb, maybe. That's why I put ruthlessly. But some of them are more cryptic than others, as you see if you stick around. Some of them are very funny and very, um, I don't know, mysterious. So, uh, ooh, I like how you said that. Um, egregiously slew him. Oh, see, I, I misled you. Yeah, so Euphorbus thrust him through from behind and Hector slew him. Yeah, 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 of course. Um, okay, so... Uh, okay, I'm just going to go on to the next one. Oh, that actually didn't... It came from... Uh, let me get a good one. I say as if this little flower to Eden blank in oh, to Eden wander. That one was good. Okay. How about this? Her hair was blank than a raven and every feature of her face in perfection. Um, I will say shinier. Ah, yes. I think you may prevail today. Blacker. Well done. Well done. Um, okay, so... Every feature of her face in perfection. I'll, so now I'll ask a question like, who gazes on this dark lady? Yeah, well, well done. See, it's it's that some some are some are impossible, some are very challenging, some are surprising, some are funny. It's all over the map. Some are easy. Uh, that one, you know, well done, well done. Okay, so this was from who would have thought it, Jonathan Swift. And I asked who gazes on this dark lady. So let me let me bring this up. Swift, what was this? On the death of Esther Johnson. I've never heard of that. I don't know if I've ever even gotten this one in here. Blacker, okay. And so here's where it came from. Uh, and it looks like, well, okay. Oh, this is the very beginning. So I like when we get to read the beginning of works because part of what inspired this is that I always loved starting books and I never had the fortitude to finish any of them. So this allows me to start gazillion books from all over inside them. And, um, but it is nice to get the first paragraph. So this is the first sentences of this book. This day being Sunday, hey, it is Sunday, January 28th, eh, not that far. Okay, so it was like 300 years ago, 1727. About eight o'clock at night, a servant brought me a note with an account of the death of the truest, most virtuous and valuable friend that I or perhaps any other person ever was blessed with. Wow, that is quite a friend. I hope you become that friend for me, Tiffany. She expired about six in the evening of this day. Of course, I don't wish that fate upon you. And as soon as I'm left alone, which is about 11 at night, hey, it's 11 at night. Uh, 
I resolve for my own satisfaction to say something of her life and character. So we're, this is where the, um, we'll get to her raven black hair. She was born at Richmond in Surrey on the 13th day of March in the year 1681. Her father was a younger brother of a good family in Nottinghamshire, her mother of a lower degree, and indeed she had little to boast of her birth. Yeah, that's, that's, I, I, I enjoy peaking interest uh, mercilessly uh, because one fun thing is you really, you get a, a taste, just a little bit of a taste of stupendous literature. And so if you can't stand the suspense or you feel somewhat perplexed at being thrown into the middle, then of course you must go out and read the book, which would be a victory for everyone. Um, I knew her from six years old and had some share in her education by directing what book she should read and perpetually instructing her in the principles of honor and virtue from which she never swerved in any one action or moment of her life. Wow, quite a young lady. She was sickly from her childhood until about the age of 15, but then grew into perfect health and was looked upon as one of the most beautiful, graceful, and agreeable young women in London, only a little too fat. Her hair was blacker than a raven, and every feature of her face in perfection. So th there it is. There's your, your blacker, which you got. She lived generally in the country with a family where she contracted an intimate friendship with another lady of more advanced years. I was then, to my mortification, settled in Ireland, and about a year after going to visit my friends in England when I found she was a little uneasy upon the death of a person on whom she had some dependence. Her fortune at that time was in all not above 1,500 pounds, the interest of which was but a scanty maintenance in so dear a country for one of her spirit. Okay, so uh, I have to restrain myself not to get too deep into this because I feel my duty here and the project of this is just to churn through these as if it's a, a shoot 'em up game. Um, uh, so I will go back to the question because the goal of the reading for me in the structure of this game is to answer the question. And so who gazes on this dark lady? We actually got the answer to that, implicitly anyway, of being the speaker. So the speaker, we don't yet know who the speaker is. Um, oh, okay, look. And look at how interestingly this is structured. This is, this is someone's diary. This is how it's structured. Like, a page or two later, it's January 29th. Yeah, exactly. That that's the game you could say. I I guessing guessing the blank is is kind of a game. Guessing the questions is a magnificent mystery that is amazing. Um uh so I'm I'm going to say just so as not to get caught up in one unless you wanted to and we could dive into it who gazes on this dark lady the man uh writing her memoir gazes on her raven hair okay uh so th that's my answer and then then it's done um hopefully in the future i like to open up the answers to people's discussion but for now that's the end of the game. So then we have the next one. It can't be summer. That got through. It's early yet for blank. There's that long time of white to cross before the blackbirds sing. So how about how about this one? Um it can't be summer, that's got through. It's early yet for autumn? That's my guess. No, wait, early yet for summer. Yeah, I think I think you're right. I'm gonna guess autumn, but uh, 
Hey, look at that. You got two in a row. That is, uh, that's pretty amazing. I, I, I have rarely ever gotten two in a row, actually. Don't, don't listen to me. Like, I'm just misleading you one by one. I, you know, I, I think me having to, like, run all these levers over here kind of cripples me. <laughs> That's my excuse anyway. But, okay, so here's here's the um, here's the chance to pose the question. So you could, you could give a shot at posing a question. Um, but let, let's see, what would I say? I would, um, that got through. It's early yet for spring. There's that long town of white to cross before the blackbirds sing. Oh, the long town of white, is that winter? Um, I would ask a general, why uh, did you, sometimes I address it to the, the speaker. Uh, well, we're making the questions. Um, so, now, at this point in the game, a, a question is formed. Um, and writing the questions to me is is part of the, the art I've found that I enjoy most. Elegantly writing the question and then answering the question is where magic occurs. Or great learning, anyway. So I would say, why why did you um, mistake the seasons? And you know, sometimes you're totally confused. Um, but okay, so that's what I'll say. Oh, so this is an Emily Dickinson poem. Um, so we're we're really uh, in for a treat. I love Emily Dickinson, um, and she is very perplexing. Um, uh okay so can't be summer yeah here we are her tiny little poems she wrote on envelopes and almost never published it can't be summer that got through it's early yet for spring there's that long town of white to cross before the blackbirds sing it can't be dying, it's too rouge. The dead shall go in white. So sunset shuts my question down with clasps of chrysolite. <laughs> All right, um, well, let's see. This one, so th this is where it can get, you need to really stretch your uh, imagination. Because um, I asked, why do you mistake the seasons? Um, which becomes a very hard question to answer. Um, um, but essentially what I'm asking, you know, why does she use this repeated phrase? It can't be summer. It can't be dying. Um, you know, and that's, this is, this is very, very perplexing. It can't be dying. It's too rouge. Um, maybe still like it's not. Winter hasn't come. There's too many flowers. The dead shall go in white. Okay, that still kind of fits. So sunset shuts my question down with clasps of chrysolite. Okay, I don't know what chrysolite is. Um, do you happen to know what chrysolite is? <laughs> so I'll actually um, look that up. Chrysolite, a yellow, green, or brownish variety of olivine used as a gemstone. Oh. Okay. Uh, yeah, wow, you're right. Yeah, look, there we go. There's a, a piece of chrysolite. Um, so, so sunset shuts my question down with clasps of chrysolite. 
Notice the, the funny overlap, which often happens, I find, where we have a blackbird here, and in the former one we had a raven, whereas that was Jonathan Swift, but this is Dickinson. It's really wild, the uh, serendipities that this churns out, but that was certainly a coincidence. Um, so really, um, as I strain to answer my question, I feel like essentially what I was asking about, which I didn't realize, when I asked why did you mistake the season, I'm kind of asking in a certain way, are you afraid of death or something? Because at first she says it can't be summer, which is what prompted me to ask the question in that way, but then she says it can't be dying. It's too rouge, the dead shall go in white, so sunset shuts my question down. And indeed, it was a question with clasps of chrysolite. It's a really beautiful image. The sunset shutting down with clasps of this green crystal. Although, I don't know. Um, this one is very hard. But I feel like I have strained myself into the beauty of the, the poem. And so I'll just venture a poetic answer, even if it's inadequate, um, and puzzle it perhaps another day. So why do you mistake the seasons? Um, I cannot bear um, to... Uh, uh, no mortality in this world where sunsets are so beautiful. That's my answer. What do you think of that answer? Could you come up with a better one? It's hard, and again, and it's a victory, but th this is this is the the structure. So I, I this is exactly the type of quandary I want to inveigle myself into. I know, I know it gets incredibly deep, and yet it's very straightforward. Uh yeah, it's a good question. I'm open for suggestions. So I've called the machine the oracle before. Um. For a while, when I started streaming on here, like two weeks ago, I was calling this what the mind was, which I kind of like still. But then to make it more kind of hip, I was calling it freestyle scholarship. So I think I'm, I don't know where I am at now with it. Um, somewhere in between. It's really, I mean, to even get at, like, what do you call it? I mean, I call it a game, but it's actually hard to even know exactly what to call what we're doing when we do the question part. Because there's really, I don't know of anything that ever had something like this. Um, you know, like, there's really no parallel for asking a question about something you don't even know what you're asking about and then finding the answer because like it's hard to pin it down to a game because you don't actually know what you're asking about like it's so um undefined like there's no rules um other than this question structure so the hypocrite who always plays one in the same part finally ceases to be a hypocrite. Uh, well, so I do sometimes bust out, hey, how's it going? That's my fan. Um, I do actually, um, when I'm inspired, um, rap or overlay music on top of the poetry, which is fun to do. Um, but really the core here is this uh, this mode of inquiry, which you know is 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 more fundamental than 
how you pronounce it. Um, but hey, man, uh, uh, g give it a shot. What do you think is this one? As in the case of priests, who when young men are always blank, consciously or unconsciously, hypocrites, and finally become naturally and then really without affectation mere priests. <laughs> That's funny. Mystery sandwich. I'm with it. Uh, I appreciate the suggestion. I'm going to say uh, initially here. Um, anyone have any other guesses? If we get a good... Um, like heroic verse, maybe I'll I'll throw up some uh, some music. You know what the music I actually think that goes best best this is with this is the Gujen. All right, thank you so much for uh, for participating. It's very fun to uh, play with other people, and I actually have at one I, I would keep score. Ah, uh, yes, either. We were on the right page. And then I, I had a, a scoring system for different types of correct answers. Like in this one, maybe you'd get a meaning point because we were, well, maybe we didn't get the meaning right. But we got the kind of part of speech right. Um, what is this anyway? Um, what is this about? Or if the father does not carry it to this extent, the son who inherits his father's calling and gets the advantage of paternal progress does. The hypocrite. Um, okay, cool, man. Thanks a lot. Oh, sweet. Yeah, finally, someone actually like popped up with my, uh, my cat. Have a nice evening. Um, it's this is the, the coming up with the question is hard because I lay a kind of an internal rule is you can't ask external questions. You have to ask the question from within the text. So, for instance, I wouldn't let myself ask what's he taught? Why is he talking about hypocrites? You know, you have to, like, put yourself in the in the work. Um, uh, um. Okay, well, how about, how about, um, how can, this is, eh, okay, how can we avoid hypocrisy? I don't, I don't really like that question, but I don't even know if I want to pursue this, but I'm curious where it came from. I actually have no idea. Oh my God, this came from Nietzsche. <laughs> so I actually will look this up. It's the, that, that is another, like, great joy of this. Huh. Um. Is is that the answer? Yeah, yeah. Well, now see now I I I, I don't know. Yeah, it's the. This is another reason why I very much like this because it 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 um. Uh, you know, pulls me out of coming with bias to works like you know i revere nietzsche in certain ways and if i had known when i got this that it was nietzsche i would have already been like wow this is so profound um but i actually thought it was some like random bad 19th century pastor or something in some preface of one of these books um and so i actually kind of dismissed it off of hand um but boy, am I wrong. So look, th this is the, uh, the, the aphorism from human all to human where this comes from. Um, and so the question we're trying to answer is, how does one avoid hypocrisy? How appearance becomes reality. The actor cannot at last refrain, even in moments of the deepest pain, 
from thinking of the effect produced by his deportment and his surroundings. For example, even at the funeral of his own child, he will weep at his sorrow and its manifestations as though he were his own audience. The hypocrite, who always plays one and the same part, finally ceases to be a hypocrite, as in the case of priests, who, when young men, are always either consciously or unconsciously hypocrites, and finally become naturally and then really, without affectation, mere priests. Or if the father does not carry it to this extent, the son, who inherits his father's calling and gets the advantage of the paternal progress, that was facetious, does. Nietzsche's father, by the way, was a pastor, a uh, Protestant pastor. When anyone, during a long period and persistently, wishes to appear something, it will at last prove difficult for him to be anything else. The calling of almost every man, even of the artist, begins with hypocrisy, with an imitation of deportment, with a copying of the effective in manner. He who always wears a mask of a friendly man must at last gain a power over friendliness of disposition, without which the expression itself of friendliness is not to be gained. And finally, friendliness of disposition gains the ascendancy over him. He is benevolent. Ooh. Very interesting. Um, so, I actually have a pretty clear answer, uh, I think, to my question. Um, how can we avoid hypocrisy? The answer is, we cannot. Sincerity can only be the power over uh, simulation we once faked. Very interesting. There's a lot of interesting truth to that. That actually rings quite true to me. Almost like you have some sense of who you want to be or how you want to be. And so you actually kind of do have to almost act your way into it. Since it's not like you can just be how you want to be. Old Father Time deputes me here before ye, not for to preach, but tell his simple story. The sage grave blank coughed and bade me say, you're one year older this important day. Um, the sage grave... Huh? The sage grave, okay, maybe that's, that's, that's an adjective after the noun. The sage grave, I'm going to say roughly, roughly coughed. Well, yeah, see, part, part of the, the challenge here, it could be, the, the challenge here at, at, a, at a baseline level is to make a reasonable guess, which can be hard to do. Um, once you have the, the contours of what's reasonable, then you can mix in inspiration or art um, if you want to. Uh, okay. Yeah, and, I, I, and it's, I'll show you when ones come up, like you can just guess ludicrous specificity, which can be funny too. Yeah, like it could be, you're right. The sage grave. Well, I, I, I don't know. 
Confucius or something, but let's see. Okay, so I'm gonna say roughly. Huh. That, okay, so it was a double adjective. This looks pretty ancient itself. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it's all over the place. Uh, and I actually have other languages in here as well. But I, I uh, don't do much with the other languages. Um, but I'd like to. Um, okay, so what's the question here? This one will be very interesting. This is pretty early English. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's Chaucer. I'm not sure. Old Father Time deputes me here before ye. Not for to preach, but tell his simple story. The sage grave ancient coughed and bade me say, you're one year older this important day. Um, why, how about why did the sage need to... Uh, uh, command you to say this okay that's my question oh this actually comes from a Robert Frost poem <laughs> see it really it really shows uh, how challenging it is to sight unseen distinguish authors and periods of time it's really fun um, and very hard uh, but light you know not not hard in a painful way necessarily um okay so this is let me clean this up oh wait oh no this is this is robert burns with a it's mislabeled this is robert burns um i think he's scottish um okay sorry just doing some uh tidying here um so we have old father time and this will be nice we might get a complete poem it's always nice when it's complete uh well i mean this is the launch as far as it's launch i actually did meet someone on here yesterday who's a better programmer than me and i have all kinds of things i'd like to do with this um like making it into a twitch bot that's one thing where people could like register their guesses and then it actually keep track of which ones they got right uh, and give people scores. That would be super fun. There's all kinds of things. I, I'd like people to be able to follow each other's answers and questions and then repose questions that people asked to other people in order to see how they answer the questions that other people constructed. But it's basically a hobby of mine. But I, I have big plans for it. But for now, it's going to be a hobby, you know. And, and I, but I, I like the idea of basically running it out of Twitch. Because I actually think that stream casting is a really good way to do it. And once it was a Twitch bot, then I could go out and do in real life streaming. And then um, basically go up to people on the street and then just pose the questions to them and then they can guess the answers uh, on the fly, which would be fun. Okay, so this is, uh, what is this? Prologue? Huh. Okay, so this is like something 105, written 1789. This is the year of the French Revolution. Um, and the question we have is, why did the sage need to command you to say this? Um, and this is the, the line that we had. The nice thing about it, and one design principle <laughs> that's been guiding me all these years as I was just like kind of tinkering towards this, is that really more important than anything else is the reading of this literature. So there, there's no real criteria outside of the fact that here we are reading Robert Burns and Emily Dickinson and Jonathan Swift 
and the Iliad. You know, like that's spectacular and can't be contained by any product or game. Prologue spoken at the theater, dumb fries, 1st of January, 1790. No song nor dance I bring from yon great city that queens it o'er our taste. The more's the pity. Though by the by, abroad, why will you roam? Good sense and taste are natives here at home. But not for panegyric I appear. I come to wish you all a good new year. This was written on the 1st of January. Old Father Time deputes me here before ye, not for to preach, but tell his simple story. The sage, grave, ancient coughed and bade me say, You're one year older this important day. If wiser too, he hinted some suggestion, but twould be rude, you know, to ask the question. And with a would-be roguish leer and wink, he bade me on you press this one word, think. Ye sprightly youths, quite flushed with hope and spirit, who think to storm the world by dint of merit, to you the dotard has a deal to say in his sly, dry, sententious proverb way. He bids you mind amid your thoughtless rattle that the first blow is ever half the battle. That though some by the skirt may try to catch him, yet by the forelock is the hold to catch him. That whether doing, suffering, or forbearing, you may do miracles by persevering. Exactly, exactly, you totally get it. Um, Last, though not least in love, ye youthful fair, angelic forms, high heaven's peculiar care. To yon old bald pate smooths his wrinkled brow, and humbly begs you'll mind the important, now. To crown your happiness, he asks your leave, and offers bliss to give and to receive. For our sincere, though haply weak endeavors, with grateful pride we own your many favors, and howsoever our tongues may ill reveal it, believe our glowing bosoms truly feel it. Hmm. Okay. Um, so the question was, why did the sage need to command you to say this? And that did have some place there. Um, because right after he said, he bade me on you. Um, and, uh, okay, so he recited this to a theater on New Year's night. Um, okay, so, so that, that's what's going on. He bade me on, so, um, now, 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 here's where uh, sharpen your quill to, to answer the question. Um, why did the sage com need to command you to say this? Um, old Father Time uh, is ignored by every generation's youth. Hence, he commands uh uh older people in vain to cherish their uh early lives that's how i'll answer it yeah well so it certainly encourages that um and and it and it takes it takes some getting used to. I've actually gotten a lot better at doing it. Um, uh, it really, it, it you really have to keep your wits about you in a in a in a particular way. Um, 
Uh, but what, what else is amazing about it is that even though you're jumping directly into the middle of things, um, in order to an answer the specific question, because all the, all the questions are specific um, about a very concrete um, part of the sentence that you're basically asking because you don't know where you are yet, that in order to answer the concrete, you, you, your mind just evokes the entire world in which the concrete exists. And so that tension between the particular and the whole somehow works very well, I've found, um, in doing this. And so you come away with this big glimpse without having to do the hard work of reading the whole book to get there. And it's a genuine glimpse since it didn't come externally. It came entirely out of the work itself. My native land, say far awa. O oh, sad and heavy, should I part, but for her sake, say far awa. Unknowing what my way may thwart, my blank land, say far awa. <laughs> uh, lovely, I say. All right. Native. Yeah, could have gotten that one. Um, unknowing what my way may thwart. Oh, look, it was in the title. <laughs> that one was staring us in the face. Um, are you going somewhere? I'll ask. Okay, th this one actually is also, again, Robert Burns, which, uh, okay. Um, actually writes a lot about my native land. Um, okay, here we go. My native land, oh yeah, okay. Oh, sad and heavy, should I part, but for her sake, say far awa. Unknowing what my way may thwart, my native land, say far awa. Thou that a thing's maker art, that form this fair, say far awa. Gee body strength, and I'll ne'er start, at this my way, say far awa. How true is love to pure desert, like mine for her, say far awa, and nocht can heal my bosom's smart, while oh she is so far awa. Nay other love, nay other dart, I feel but hers, say far awa, but fairer never touched a heart than hers the fair, say far awa. Hmm. Nice. Burns is a Scottish poet who uses, uh, like some strange, like Celtic English, uh, combinations. Um, so my question was, uh, are you going somewhere? And, um,. I don't really actually detect a journey <laughs> in, in the poem, per se. Um, but the first line does seem to indicate that he might leave. Um, and so I'll say, nah. Nah. He loves his homeland his sweetheart 
And I'll leave it at that. Whoops. There's wind and sleet on the bitter street, and it nips the blank and numbs the feet. Okay. Aw. Well, it's free for now. But yeah, uh, yeah, please do check back. I, uh, maybe with the help of this person, we can, um, we can open it up to other people to use uh, pretty soon. So thanks for stopping by. Okay, yeah. Hands. Wait, let me... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me guess. It nips... Uh, okay, I'm going to say ears. <laughs> oh! I, I, would, I would give you the, uh, the prize there. Uh, and this one... Uh, it actually came from some, some like early 20th century compendium of verse which if you just wait one more second um i'll pull up the volume and then we can find out who the author was because this is actually an anthology um okay electric signs um okay so so th this is this is the Salvation Army's song by Phoebe Hoffman, written sometime, uh, sometime in the early part of the 20th century, maybe the late 19th century. So anyway, have a wonderful day. Have a wonderful day. I'm going to read the song. Maybe I'll sing it if I'm inspired. Yeah, sure. See ya. It's Christmas time. It's Christmas time. Echo the feet in the dusty street. It's Christmas time, it's Christmas time, the quavering tambourines repeat. God looks down from his judgment seat, good will on earth is his message sweet. Turn your hearts to the Lord. The chimes will ring on Christmas day, the chimes will ring on Christmas day, and rich and poor will kneel and pray. The rich will feast on Christmas day, the poor will fast on Christmas Day. Have you no might to give away, so the poor may eat on Christmas Day? If you've only a penny or a nickel or a dime, drop it in, drop it in, listen to it chime. Take a silver minute from your treasured time, listen to it tinkle a little chime, for the poor lost sheep of the Lord. There's wind and sleet on the bitter street, and it nips the fingers and numbs the feet. Electric signs flash on and out. Yay! And gold-eyed motors dart about, and trolleys jangle, and crowds untangle, and still they stand on their icy beat, and still the tambourines repeat. God looks down from his judgment seat, Good will on earth is his message sweet. Oh, give, oh, give, so the poor may eat. They are caked with ice from the driving sleet, and they sling their arms and they stamp their feet, and glory in the pain and the freezing sleet, for they are the soldiers of the Lord. Wow. So that's what the bell ringers uh, from the Salvation Army used to sing a hundred years ago. Leon, back to blissful solitude.
Life of Onesicritus. Onesicritus is called by some authors on a Ginetan, but Demetrius the Magnesian affirms that he was a native of Astapalea. Oh, I want to move to Astapalea. Who wouldn't want to move to Astapalea? What did he do in Ace 